Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Atomy Brainwaves, our podcast on education for educators. Brainwaves is produced by our wonderful team here at Atomy, an online teaching and learning platform for secondary education. We provide engaging, curriculum-specific videos and text lessons for over 190 subjects, as well as matching quizzes and exam practice that can be used for both learning and formative assessment. We also provide powerful analytics that can help teachers diagnose how their students are progressing and zero in on who might need a little bit of extra help. We aim to make life easier for teachers, give them more time to work on the most important things, and ultimately help to generate better outcomes. If you'd like to find out more about Atomy, head over to getatomy.com and feel free to give it a go for free. This week, I had the pleasure of speaking to Catlin Tucker, a US-based best-selling author, keynote speaker, and innovator. We discussed a variety of resources and techniques for bringing blended learning into the classroom, explored Catlin's role as a blended learning coach within schools, and examined how the growing prevalence of blended learning might impact how classrooms look in years to come. If that sounds like your thing, subscribe to us at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever platform you prefer, and make sure to leave us a quick five-star review. For now, enjoy. Are you going to teach us anything? What, you want me to teach you something? You want to learn something? All right. You got it! Hey everybody, welcome back to Atomy Brainwaves. I'm your host Simon and I'm joined today by a very special guest, Catlin Tucker, Google certified innovator, best-selling author, international trainer and blended learning coach and former teacher of the year. Welcome, Catlin. Thank you, I'm glad to be with you. Yes, and let me say right at the top, you have the esteem, the honor of being our very first guest from the United States. Get out. That is an honor. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it certainly is. First of many, hopefully, but you know what they say, the first is the best. Right. So Clearly. You've, you have that. You have that accolade. <laughs> you have that, um, that honor amongst many of the other accolades that we've run through there. And as I mentioned, blended learning mm-hmm. in that uh, little intro is sort of a, an area of expertise for you. We'll be kind of diving into that in detail as we go but just to start whenever we have a guest on not american guests because as i say you're my first (laughs) but whenever we've had other guests before uh we like to start with a run through of their journey in education to date so why don't you just give us a quick a quick breakdown of education where you started and how you got to where you are today Yeah, so I started teaching in 2001, and I was an English teacher at the high school level, and I taught for probably five years, just traditional. I taught the way I was taught, the way I was taught to teach, no technology really, save, you know, renting a DVD and playing part of a movie or something, and it didn't take me very long to feel totally disillusioned with this profession. I remember feeling that I had made this enormous mistake choosing education for my career path. It just, the kids didn't seem to want to be in my classroom. They didn't lean into discussions. They didn't want to take risks. And I definitely felt that I was failing. You know, I had imagined this classroom that I was going to create when I was in credential school working to be a teacher. And then I got into my classroom and I wasn't able to do it. And I felt like I was missing something. So in this moment of career crisis, I thought, well, I can either figure out how to do this job differently, or I can get a different job. And I ended up going on maternity leave right around that time to take care of my daughter. And during maternity leave, I started teaching online courses, mostly to supplement our income because my husband is a teacher and living on one teacher salary is not a spectacular experience. And so I was teaching these online courses and it was really challenging, a totally new skill set for me as an instructor, as a teacher. But I really saw so much potential in 
using technology to engage learners. So when my maternity leave was up and I returned to the classroom, even though I was in a very low tech classroom, the school did not have a lot of technology, I was determined to try to figure out, could I weave in some of these online components to engage my students, to change my reality in these classrooms where I had been struggling to really get kids to lean in and engage with me and and with each other. So that was really the catalyst for me that got me excited about weaving together the offline and the online learning experience for kids. And I just never stopped. It kind of like I started with online discussions and I just kept building. And I think for me, it was like one little success led me to want to try just a bunch of different strategies and technology tools. Yeah, that's amazing. It's really fascinating to see that particular avenue that you went down rather than discovering that online segment within uh the school system it was outside of it was that chance to to get a break um which sort of opened that up for you it sounds yeah. like yeah if i had waited for my school district to introduce online learning or blended learning i mean i'd probably still be waiting it's not they're still not doing it there's not a lot of technology necessarily woven into the class setting yeah no absolutely it's 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 definitely something that we ourselves have uh, encountered before with various guests, uh, this issue of kind of slowness of, of schools. I guess just to, to pick up on that for a moment before we, we get around to blended learning, because we've a lot of our focus on the pod so far has naturally enough been on the state of play with regards to technology in Australian schools. But mm-hmm. just on that on that subject, could you talk for a minute about what it's like over in the States. I know it's such a big, there are uh, rather big, uh, big samples to talk (laughs) about there, but within your own experience uh, over there, what would you talk about the state of play with regards to introducing technology and online resources to the classroom? What's it like at the moment? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a huge country and I travel all over working with teachers and school districts and the spectrum of access, the spectrum of technology use is so wide. So I'll go to schools where it's one-to-one, students take a device home every single night, they're working off of a learning management system. It's very dynamic. The technology is woven into everything that they do. And then I go into schools where there's either not access to technology or there are Chromebook carts, you know, just carts that sit in the room and teachers don't Mm. open them because they haven't been trained on how to use them and they feel like they lose so much time just unlocking the cart and passing out the Chromebooks and then collecting the Chromebooks that they don't really see the value of using them on the daily base on a daily basis. And so you have this really interesting kind of dichotomy between schools that are running with technology and running running with blended learning models. And then you have schools where quite frankly, it looks like a classroom I could have been in when I was in high school 20 years ago. Yeah. It's really fascinating to hear that because I guess kind of from the outsider perception of the states, maybe sometimes there can be a, a, a sort of a tendency to think of it as a country that would be more at the, the cutting edge with regards to things like this. But the sense that I'm getting is it's very much similar to Australia or even the UK or Ireland where you have some schools which are really you know, are right at the forefront, the vanguard of this this movement to bring in technology. And then you have schools at the complete other end of the spectrum. So it, it's, it sounds very much the case that it you can't put a blanket statement on it. it. It really depends from school to school. It does. And what's fascinating from my perspective is how often I work with schools where they had money or enough funding to just buy all this technology or you know, boost up their Wi-Fi infrastructure to support devices. And then just simply dumping devices in schools didn't change practice. It didn't improve learning for students. So then they kind of doubled back and said, okay, how do we use this technology effectively? And then that's where I end up being invited into the conversation is, okay, let's talk to Catelyn and figure out how do we embrace this idea of blended learning so that we can maximize the potential of these devices that we invested all of this money in. And so often there's this interesting disconnect between 
We know how to spend money on devices. We can check that off of our list, but they're not investing in the same way in building a professional learning infrastructure that can support teachers as they're radically changing their practice. Because what we're asking them to do for those folks who've been in the classroom for quite a while is to really rethink how they design and facilitate lessons. Yeah, it's a really good point, this idea of devices can't be just brought in for device's sake. It, there has to be a purpose. There has to be a plan, a strategy behind it. And, you know, you, you brought up there your role when you were in the room and we're we're going to get to that later on. I'm really excited to to kind of parse through that. But before we get there, um, let's just quickly run through blended learning. So mm-hmm. we've... Uh, older or not older regular listeners rather will know that we've already uh listeners of any age will right. know that we have uh we've covered blended learning uh in an episode from our season one but there's no harm in having a quick recap from uh from an expert such as yourself so if you could for our listeners just run through uh very quickly what blended learning is the theory behind it and what it can bring to a modern classroom Yeah. So you can, you know, I always tell teachers, you can go online, you can Google blended learning. The established definition for the K-12 space really is from the Christensen Institute, and it's about a paragraph long. But when I am describing it for educators, I really stress that it is the combination of active engaged learning online combined with active engaged learning offline face-to-face. And the term blended learning is like an umbrella. And underneath that umbrella are a variety of different models. There's, you know, the station rotation model and the flip classroom model, and you've got the playlist or the individual rotation model. And so each of the different models is designed to give students different degrees of control over their learning. So ideally, we're trying to give students more control over the time, the place, the pace and the path of their learning. And so the different models give them different degrees of control. And they're not going to control all of those things all of the time, usually. But the idea is to give them more control over their learning. And so one of the things that's interesting when I work with teachers in the States in particular, is there's a real fear of giving up control. And at the heart of blended learning, it really is this shift in control from teacher to learner. And so getting people comfortable with that and seeing the value of that is really crucial. And I'm actually in um, the late stages of my own doctoral journey. And so when I think about blended learning and, and online learning, quite frankly, It's very much anchored in this community of inquiry framework, which is the theoretical framework that I tend to lean on when I talk about blended learning and online learning. Because one of the things I worry about is particularly in this moment where teachers are being forced online without a ton of preparation, maybe they haven't used technology or engaged Mm -hmm. kids online much to this point. My concern is Teaching online is about much more than disseminating and collecting assignments. Teaching online is an art form. And so we really have to think about how are we building an online community of learners, whether that's to complement the face-to-face or because we're teaching entirely online. So the community of inquiry talks about like the role of the teacher and the social presence and the cognitive presence and how those three presences kind of interplay to create this dynamic learning experience. And I don't know that uh, particularly in the States, we're having that conversation yet about creating those community of learners online. Yeah. And I guess as we, as we touched on before, it really is things happening at different paces. You you talked about the current situation. We're going to get to that later on and how that might affect the conversation. But just to pick up on one thing you were talking about there, I think, you know, a lot of really um really fascinating ideas with regards to blended learning in there but one i just want to talk about for a second is this notion of control which you were talking about in the earlier part of your answer there and i think i think what's very important um is to make the distinction about what kind of control is being talked about because you know a teacher who's maybe not familiar with blended learning not familiar with online resources might hear something like you know giving students control control of their journey and misinterpret that as losing control of the classroom losing control of discipline but would it be fair to say that 
it's kind of there's a subtle difference between control of you know a room keeping everybody obviously that's not available now everyone's in online classrooms but when it's within the school context control of a room keeping everybody you know i guess behaved and interacting in a respectful way and then what blended learning refers to which is the educational journey the other side of it and that's where it's this idea of putting control in the student's hands yeah i do think that's an important distinction although sometimes i think that teachers are so focused on the management and the compliance that they squash the creativity in the classroom and they end up creating more challenges for themselves and my hope is that blended learning and kind of thinking of these different instructional models and how to shift the focus to students and better differentiate and personalize, all these things should help to keep kids more engaged and hopefully minimize some of those classroom management issues. Because I think the most, the best way to combat a class management issue or you know, problems is really to have kids engaged and excited yeah. about learning. And what causes them to disengage often is because a lesson is too fast or it's too slow or it's too hard or it's too easy. And all these pieces, it doesn't speak to where they're at. And it's easy for them to just kind of disconnect and make their own fun. And so I do, you have to have clear boundaries as a teacher. You have to have clear expectations. You have to spend time creating that safe space in your classroom where kids know what the expectations are. So that piece, of course, the teacher teacher has to be a leader in that sense. And when I talk about control, it it definitely maybe spills more into the student agency category where mm -hmm. instead of us telling them exactly what to do, how to do it, how to demonstrate their learning, we give them more opportunities to have a voice in that, to make decisions, to have some choice. So yeah, there is a difference, but I feel like even the control of that classroom and the management hopefully by adopting these other models that shift the focus to kids, we don't have to have such a death grip on the the class, you know, even in real time. Yeah, that's true. Very much so. It's kind of the case of organized chaos isn't the right phrase, <laughs> but certainly m m more room for what might appear chaotic behavior, but is in fact just a more creative space a more flexible space and that that kind of really is what blended learning is all about in a certain way isn't it having that 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 flexibility and movement within it to find where the right spot is for for the class in question absolutely and i think it's easy to forget that learning is a social endeavor they should be interacting they should be having conversations and yes sometimes that's going to create noise and a little bit of that chaos but it doesn't mean learning's not happening and so many teachers are so afraid of that kind of chaos that happens when kids are learning and exploring and problem solving together or creating together that they they don't allow kids that space and instead kids are being asked to sit in classrooms for hours during their day quietly listening no wonder so many of them are like coming out of their skin and creating mischief in the classroom because they're bored and they haven't been given the space to engage with one another even though they're young people yeah, it's definitely true. I've, uh, that transported me right back to my own <laughs> school days right there. The difficulties of sitting still in the class. Was, so, some people always seem great at it. Some people just had this uncanny knack of doing it. I unfortunately uh, n never could. But um, <laughs> what you're saying is I was the, the one in the ride all along right. for, uh, <laughs> for, for being like that. There are a lot of kids like that who do not do well sitting for hours every single day quietly listening. It's just, it's kind of unnatural. No, it's, it's absolutely the case. And, and, and a real strength of blended learning that is, is that flexibility, the fact that it opens up those doors. And, and also what, what should be stressed and what I think sometimes can get lost in the mail, so to speak, is that, you know, blended learning is blended it is the blend of offline and online. It's not just, you know, I think there can be a misconception of, of people focusing too much in the online segment of it. But, you know, it, it is about that blend between the two. It's not totally moving the, the entire teaching process into 
various online programs. It's about just as much, if not more, about the offline element as well. No, I totally agree. And I think some of that misconception really stems from the fact that the way blended learning was early on implemented in higher education is very different from how it's being implemented in K-12. And so blended learning did take these offline pieces and just move them online. And there was a much more, much more of a focus on the online portion. Whereas I absolutely agree with what you're saying. When I work with teachers, my goal is let's talk about the balance. How are you balancing the online with the offline? How are you balancing the individual with the collaborative? Because another issue I see quite frequently is the online space is used to isolate learners, right? The teacher kind of does their thing and then they put students on computers. They ask them to pop in their headphones and work on a program or watch a video. And they're not leveraging the potential of the technology to connect kids and foster communication and collaboration and creation online. And so how are you balancing those? And how are you balancing the teacher voice with the student voice and self-assessment with teacher assessment? Like all of those pieces are so critical, but they do need to be in balance when we think about designing these lessons. Yeah, for sure. And they do, they do absolutely need to be used the right way, which which kind of brings me to what I wanted to talk about next was moving a little bit away from the theory and more into this idea of blended learning in action. The first thing I wanted to ask you about was tools and resources. Obviously, you know, resources play such a huge role within blended learning. I wanted to ask you about what, what are the kind of the best resources um, that teachers can use to bring blended learning into their classroom and how can they use it in the right use them in the right way that's a huge question so i think one of time no rush let me list off all the resources (laughs) teachers can use um i think first and foremost it's incredibly helpful to have a learning management system and whether that is google classroom which is there's some debate about is that really a learning management system? Is it slightly different? But having a space online where kids know they can go to access resources, information, engage in discussion, uh, that is really critical because your learning management system or your Google Classroom, it really becomes your virtual classroom. So I tell teachers when you're engaging kids offline, make sure that the resources and the directions they are offline. And if you're going to be driving them online in the class or beyond the class, drive them to that learning management that system where there's like the hub of information they need. Then for me, I'm a really big fan of like choose the best tool for the job you're doing. And some teachers don't have the bandwidth to have half a dozen to a dozen tools that they regularly use and leverage. But if I want kids, you know, recording a video, am I going to ask them to use Screencastify to record something on their computer? Am I going to engage them in like a flip grid where everybody's recording in one spot so I can see it? Um, if we're doing online discussions, hopefully I can use my learning management system for that. There, I mean, there's just so many different tools out there. And I know a lot of schools, when they shift to blended learning initially, they will get teachers on a learning management system, and then they will connect them with, you know, different personalized practice software, um, which tends to be kind of pricey. So some schools do it and some don't. And then there are all these other tools like the, the Flipgrid and the Padlet and that teachers can kind of add on depending on what they're trying to get kids to do online. So for me, you know, if, if you're a math teacher, the tools and the resources you're using online are going to be wildly different probably from what I gravitate to as an English teacher, right? They're probably using Desmos and graphing tools and things to really engage kids in applying knowledge online or applying what they're learning online. So there's what's exciting is how many different tools are popping up all of the time. They do disappear and they do end up being paid for products sometimes, but there's so much out there for teachers who are, are looking for different ways to engage kids online. Yeah, which is great that there is, I guess, an ever-growing library of great resources out there. At the same time, it, you know, it, it should be said that the playing field is not entirely peaches and cream. There are, <laughs> you know, plenty of plenty of resources which are either in and of themselves not particularly useful or or maybe just aren't suited to as you, you you talked a little bit about distinctions between you know yourself as an English teacher and maybe a maths teacher for example so what how would you as a teacher 
kind of identify the right resource for you? How would you be able to tell this is going to work for me in this situation or this resource is actually not, even if it comes highly recommended, it's not all that good? How does, what are the telltale signs? I think for me, when I try out a tool, my focus is on the student response. How is the student engaging with the tool? What am I noticing about whether they're leaning in or whether they seem frustrated or whether they seem excited? So for me, it's the response of the students, what impact it has on engagement is huge. So for example, I always want to keep kids kind of engaged around video content. One of the big criticisms of the flip classroom or flip learning is, you know, we're just putting this video content online and kids are watching it. They're still in this kind of passive consumptive role. So it's really a radically different approach to teaching. So when I started flipping or when I coach teachers, we talk about what are strategies you can use to engage kids around that video content. So I remember playing with, you know, wrapping videos in an online discussion and having kids watch the video and then discuss some issue in the video. So I could see what were they pulling out of the video. And and then I started playing with like Edpuzzle, which is a fun tool where you can drop questions in the video and you can have it pause so kids have to respond to things or you can add these like audio notes prompting kids to do something. And as I was watching, so I did this in real time in the classroom, there was a station where they were watching the videos and engaging with the questions and just their energy around kind of leaning in, their attention, all of that communicated to me, this is a good strategy. Using Edpuzzle to engage them around this video content or having them watch the video content and then do something very specific in an asynchronous online discussion worked really well. So, But I've definitely tried tools where I thought it was going to go great or I told the teacher that I was coaching like, hey, you want to try this? Let's do it. And we would build like a little experience around it. And yeah, kids were like super lukewarm. They didn't seem that excited. They didn't respond to the activity. And then we just didn't use it again because it's really about how do the kids respond. And I I wish more teachers were proactively asking students for feedback when they try something new. Like, how did this go for you? What did you like? What did you not like? Is, is it something we could tweak or modify to make it more engaging or exciting? Or did it just not help you? Or was it really hard to navigate? But a lot of times that that conversation that feedback loop isn't happening yeah it's really it's so important isn't it that element of feedback that sort of trial and error uh approach to take to us and very encouraging from an anatomy perspective to hear some of the things you were mentioning because a lot of those features are ones that we that we have included in our own videos so good to know we're taking a few of those boxes <laughs> but um i wanted to ask just following on from that so when you talk about student response is it is it sort of a case that you know straight away if you if you try a new resource you know if it doesn't hit with the students straight away you're like we we just need to chalk this one up as a learning curve and move on or is there an element of should we give this time could this sort of kick into gear as we go along i know it's sort of a slightly vague question without the the context of a specific resource but i guess in in general is there that sense of it needs to hit with the students right away or else it's not worth pursuing no not necessarily i think if it doesn't hit there could be lots of reasons why a, a resource or a tool is is not hitting for them and i don't always know why that is if i don't ask them i also think you know just to use like online examples is uh, online discussions as an example kids just don't know how to have academic conversations online. That's not something that they're proficient at. Yes, they text. Yes, they send snaps on Snapchat. But that's a very different style of communication than I'm going to respond to an academic discussion question and then reply to my peers and engage in that way. And so for me, it's also sometimes I realize there are just gaps in terms of what they're able to do, what their skills are. And so then the focus for me becomes, I know I want them engaging in academic online discussions. That's a critical skill that they need for any online learning scenario and when they go to college. Um, so it's about supporting them. 
how do you respond in a respectful, substantive way when you're engaging with your peers? So I definitely don't abandon a strategy or a tool if it falls flat the first time, but it becomes my job as the educator or my job as a coach supporting teachers to figure out how do we determine why this didn't go well? Was it a a lack in skill or was it really hard for them to navigate or did they just not enjoy it? And so again, I think asking students for feedback, creating some space or an environment where it's safe for them to say, this is how I feel about this. This is why I didn't enjoy this, or this is why I really enjoyed this, or I think I could enjoy this if I knew how to do X, Y, or Z becomes a really important part of shifting practice and adopting new tools and strategies is students are the customers. They consume what we dish out. We should be asking them how it's going. (laughs) Yeah, it's so, it's so true. I mean, it, it sounds almost so simple to say, and yet it is really worth saying because it gets missed a lot that the, that feedback loop is so important, mm-hmm. isn't it? Um, yes. ha- like having that open channel of communication, because otherwise, how can you know whether something is, you know, whether you stick with it for a day, a week, a month, if there's no back and forth about it, it's, it, it's almost a, a, a sunk cost at that point. Well, and I I wish teachers really saw students as their partners in this learning journey. And if we truly see students as our partners, then communication and feedback, it has to be two way. But in a lot of classrooms, it's one way teacher giving student all kinds of feedback. And it's fascinating because I think part of the reason we don't ask for feedback is because we're nervous about what they will say, quite frankly. But we give them critical feedback all the time. And so I think we communicate that we respect them as students, as people, when we invite them to give us feedback or the course feedback, right? It doesn't have to be feedback on us necessarily, but the strategies and the tools and and how we're how we're using them yeah because that's the key thing isn't it getting feedback isn't like an open admission that you know you are doing everything wrong it's it's also not saying that you're going to do whatever like if, if the student feedback is we should be having ice cream starter day every day you're not going <laughs> to then say okay yeah well that was the student feedback so that's what we're going to do ice cream but for it, everyone <laughs> yes well maybe it's not the worst idea in the world you know, something to think about for the teachers out there but you know what i mean it, it's not a, an admission of i'm going to do whatever the students say it's it's just i'm going to take on board and what they have to say and give it proper consideration and let that mold the approach from there which as you say does build a mutual respect Yeah. Well, and it's enlightening as a teacher. So at the end of every semester, I used to have my kids as their semester exit ticket, complete a really detailed Google form about what went well and what they enjoyed and what they found beneficial and what they didn't enjoy and what they would cut. And for years, my students would say the one of the classroom routines there, one of the things they wanted to do less on was annotations. But I'm an English person. I would never have uh, graduated from UCLA with my English degree without annotating. So I was super immovable. I was like, nope, this has Mm. to happen. Sorry. Even though literally 90% of kids were like, no, we don't want to annotate anymore. And then one one year when kind of sketch noting became kind of this popular way to take notes during conferences or while reading books, um, and I was seeing them all over the internet, I thought, well, maybe, maybe everybody doesn't have to do it the way I did it. What if I introduce how to annotate like traditional annotations? And then what if I tr- introduce like how to do a, you know, a dialogue, like a, like a journal entry for reading or sketch notes for reading. And then once they've practiced each one, the rest of the year, they get to choose. You have to do something when you read, but you have these three different options. And then I never heard another person complain about annotations in my Google Google form feedback. There you go. Yeah. But I think if I hadn't been asking and if, if I hadn't kept reading that this was something they didn't enjoy, I wouldn't have started to consider other ways to get them to think critically about the literature we were reading, but maybe in a different way, giving them some yeah. agency. There you go. A classic example of feedback, getting a positive result, even if it did take a while by the sense of things for <laughs> the did. feedback to finally hammer home, it did get there in the end. Um, also, one thing just occurs to me, going back to what you were saying about the difficulty students have in engaging in an online academic conversation, mm-hmm. um, I just had a flashback to what my online 
or like text communication was in my definitely earlier school days and this practice we used to have of like intentionally spelling words wrong oh. or saying things <laughs> like you know uh, where are you would be w r space r space u so i can certainly see why with kind of if that's the mode of online communication i don't know if that is still the case but definitely not all that conducive to academic written conversation for sure no, um, I can see how that would not be conducive to online no, discussions. No. <laughs> but then again, maybe, maybe that was just my that was just my circle of friends. Who knows? Hey, folks! Hope you're enjoying the episode so far, and we've got plenty more to come after this quick break. Here at Atomy Brainwaves, we're all about education, and not just for students, for ourselves too. We would love to hear from you, whether that's feedback on one of our episodes or a question you'd like to see answered by one of our guests or by Sue. So, if you've got a comment or a question, don't hesitate to email us at brainwaves at getatomy.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, let's get back to it. Um, so, that's the kind of resources side of it. The other, I kind of, I guess, side of it, which pairs with it, is this idea of blended learning techniques. Mm. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned a couple earlier and you know we could probably be here all day if we wanted to go through every single one but just I wanted to see if you could run us through a few kind of techniques which you reckon are are generally quite successful which which can be be used in a variety of classrooms regardless of whatever their particular situation is I guess the best or whatever springs to mind is the best blended learning techniques. Yeah, so the the models that I typically train teachers on because of the way in which traditional schools are formatted are the station rotation, the whole group rotation, and the playlist model, and then the flip learning model. So those tend to be the most popular because they work really well in a traditional class setting. So the station rotation model is really, it's a lot easier for some reason for elementary to make the shift to that model. And I think in part, it's because they have their kids all day long. They have to change things up. They're used to using learning stations or centers in their class. They may never have used technology in those stations. So for elementary teachers, the challenge becomes, how do I use technology to enhance and improve the learning? And that's a much easier ask. Whereas in the States, secondary teachers, so middle school, high school, they are most often trained to write a single agenda, so one lesson for the entire class, and they write it on the board, and then they kind of march through it with the class, all together, teacher-paced, everybody working on the same task at the same time. So the idea for them of taking that agenda and kind of turning it on its side and pulling apart the pieces to create a rotation feels very foreign. But what I like about the station rotation model is that you don't have to have one-to-one -to, -one to make it work. So for those schools where equity access are big issues and teachers might only have six devices in their classroom, you can still use that model with those six devices. So that's exciting. And then you also shift the focus from the teacher at the front of the room to the students because they're sitting in groups of four to six, they're navigating tasks together, they're having conversations. And then when I'm planning a station rotation model with teachers, we really think about, let's balance them by having them go from an offline to an online to an offline to an online, like really build that into the rotation. So every other station they hit is a different kind of interaction. And if they're doing an online station here where they have headphones in and they're watching a video, then that's an individual online station. Let's make the next one an offline collaborative station where we're challenging them to work with their peers to get something done. And then maybe after that offline collaboration station, station, they move to work directly with their teacher. And so I think because it's these individual stations and they might hit all the stations in one period, they might be a multi-day rotation where it's six stations that they hit over the course of two different days. It is easier to understand and think about that balance of how are we thinking of the different parts of this lesson and, and what kids are going to be doing over here versus what they're doing over here. Um, so that's a that's one that's really popular. But like I said, a lot harder for secondary than elementary. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And then it's funny because when I wrote my first book on blended learning, it was like 2012 and people would say, oh, you wrote a book. What's it about? And I'd say blended learning. And it was just crickets. Nobody knew what I was talking about, (laughs) but everybody knew or a lot of people knew what the flipped classroom was. So the idea of sending video content home was easy for teachers to understand. It freed up this time and space in the classroom. What I'm seeing in the States is a little bit of pushback against homework in general, but against sending that video content home with kids. So one of the strategies that I focus on when I work with teachers who are interested in the flipped learning is what I call it since now we're not like sending it outside the classroom, but when they're interested in that model is how do you weave that video content into the classroom to avoid sending it home? So maybe before kids ever see a video, they're in small groups and they're working together to make predictions, or maybe you're asking them to ask questions and you're driving inquiry or you're trying to assess their prior knowledge. What do they already know about the topic they're going to be diving into in the video? And then you navigate everybody online to watch the video, but kind of create a buffer of time around that video so they can pause it, they can catch up on their notes, they can rewatch a little section. The the Mm -hmm. issue with the flipped classroom is if you move it into the classroom, you really have to be cognizant that they lost control over the time and the place. So you want to make sure they can still control the pace at which they make their way through the content. And then once kids are done, you can transition them off to apply and practice in pairs or small groups and really fold that video content into the classroom. So lots of different strategies that are popular here. Um, And it seems like different strategies appeal to teachers who are teaching at different age levels. Yeah, definitely, definitely is the case. Different things are going to suit different levels. But one one thing just in relation to those two examples, and I would say particularly station rotation that I think really appeals is, I guess one stick with which to beat blended learning has been, you know, a criticism that it's sort of a perceived reliance of technology might box out schools who don't have access to the same level of resources, households which don't have multiple devices whatever that that Mm -hmm. that other schools will have but the impression i'm getting which with relation to these strategies is that in actual fact it 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 doesn't have to be the case that you need to be able to get every single resource under the sun no matter how outlandish or expensive you can implement techniques you can use certain specifically selected online resources that are readily and easily available to kind of get the best out of blended learning without having to be in that position. Oh my gosh, I could not agree with that more. So my entire teaching career when I was blending was at a school, like I said, that had very low tech. Uh, I was in the beginning leveraging the devices walking through the door with my kids. So in the beginning, it was like when kids had phones and only one in four kids had a phone, but we were leveraging those devices to get online and collaborate in the classroom. But my school's never paid for an LMS. I've only ever used the free version of Schoology and Google Classroom, the entire Google Suite, which is free. I try not to pay for tools just because it's such, you know, if I start individually paying for tools as a teacher, that can get really expensive really fast. But the Mm -hmm. amount of tools that have a free version that do allow you to do quite robust things like even my video instruction using screencastify they limit the videos to five minutes that is not a big issue i don't want to record much more than five minutes for my kiddos because they're not going to stay tuned into that video so yeah i don't think you necessarily need a bunch of really robust paid for tools what i will say the caveat to that is That is for a teacher who is like me, who likes tech, who'll poke around, figure out what works and what's available to me. Whereas you'll have teachers who are like, just give me the one-stop shop. Give me the paid-for LMS with all the bells and whistles. That's all I'm going to use. Yeah. And that's one that's one avenue, I guess, to walk to. It hasn't been my journey with blended learning or how I talk about blended learning, but I see a lot of school districts that move that direction as well. Yeah, but the the important distinction to make is that both avenues certainly exist. Neither is necessarily better than the other, but that avenue, the one you have taken of figuring out, you know, the best resources which are free and readily available and not having to push the boat out, it is there, it does exist, and it's not the case that you have to, you know, just 
splash the cash on some huge suite of resources. No, absolutely. And I think one of the things that is also kind of worth pointing out when you said that there's this idea kids have to be able to get online and have devices and do all this stuff from home, the online portion of blended learning, particularly when we talk about younger learners, that can happen entirely in the classroom. It doesn't have to extend beyond the school day. It absolutely can. And there are schools that have adjusted schedules. So kids are on campus for X number of days and they're learning online for X number of days. And I think probably after this whole COVID-19, we're going to see a little bit more of that, but it doesn't have to extend beyond the classroom. So for teachers who are like, my kiddos are too young, my kids need more support, I don't know if they have access, or I hate homework, then pull it into the classroom and just weave it into that experience for learners. Yeah, 100%. It really is about finding the right resource and the right technique for you, for your classroom, and all of the other factors are, are really pale in comparison to that so the next thing i wanted to ask you about is to kind of zero in on your specific role and get an insight into what you do because you know your your sort of role as a blended learning advocate blended learning coach uh, is a really fascinating one <laughs> and uh would, would very excited to hear more about it but i guess the first thing is what what is involved in i guess selling blended learning to schools getting them on board you know you've you've done a terrific job here uh on this Thank pod <laughs> but what does it involve when you're when you're in the room talking to to principals shareholders uh of individual schools yeah well it's interesting because i think this conversation is going to change but for me when i come in and i talk about blended learning i'm focused on kind of the the value proposition for kids uh, and and teachers it's easier to differentiate you make more time for small group instruction you give students more agency so that hopefully they're more motivated to do work so i talk about all of the the by the positive byproducts that can happen when we when we talk about blended learning because all schools know differentiating at the very least and ideally personalizing at the best is where we want to head in education and that's just absolutely impossible to do in a whole group lesson that is teacher led. So making time for that, the small group instruction where teachers get to sit with six to eight kids or a single kid and really focus on what they need during a class period is wildly attractive to school districts, right? That's not a tough sell. And I honestly believe that in a number of years, blended learning it'll just be learning. Like we're calling it this totally separate thing, but technology is not going anywhere. It's permeating every single aspect of our lives. It is doing the same thing in education, though education has been a little slower to get excited about that change. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I love the different models, but for me, the more I coach teachers, the more I work with blended learning, the models just blend together, right? So it's not like I'm using discrete models. They all kind of start to interweave together when you really adopt technology into your practice and you really start to ask yourself, how do I put students at the center of learning? How do I architect learning experiences that allow kids to make choices, to construct meaning, to work together, all of those pieces. So it's not a it's not a tough sell. Most of the time when I get pulled into a district and they they want me to work with teachers in a coaching capacity for a certain number of days they're they're already understanding the benefits they're just needing someone to help support teachers from understanding the strategies and the models to implementing the strategies and the models and that's really where i come into play usually okay sounds like it's pretty pretty handy there to be in a position to i guess sort of the wave has already started you're kind of riding the crest of it because as you say technology is here it's here to stay and it's schools who are already minded towards that but mm -hmm. within you know that that question of training teachers coaching them I, I i'd love to hear about what's involved in that because i imagine you know for every for every teacher who's enthusiastic and who may already be quite technologically savvy i'm sure mm -hmm. there are plenty who might not be quite so technologically inclined, maybe a little bit resistant, or even if not, just struggle to to grasp what's involved in these steps. So, you know, when you're when when faced with these challenges, first of all, what do these challenges look like, and how 
do you overcome them when mm-hmm. coaching teachers? So typically before I start coaching one-on-one, I will work with a staff in a whole group training capacity. So the school district wants everybody to at least have some foundational understanding of the model or models that they're going to pilot or they're going to start with. So I might work with a group of teachers for a day or two just on the station rotation model. And before we dive into our work, I ask them the question, what are the biggest challenges you face as a teacher? What are those hurdles that make it challenging to teach and reach all students? So I invite them. <clears throat> so I invite them <laughs> to yeah, share those. Fire away. Right, okay. Um, to share those challenges. And so I use a tool called Mentimeter and I will ask them to share like their top three challenges or I like to call them pain points because this profession is really challenging and multifaceted. And so I want them to know I'm not scared of the challenges. I taught for 16 years. I coach teachers. I'm like right in the thick of it. So let's talk about it. Let's be honest. And things like time, um, behavior, lack of engagement, lack of motivation, all of these things pop up, attendance issues. And so I'm able to craft the message of, okay, here are all the challenges. And most of them I have faced directly as a teacher. How will blended learning help you to, at the very least, mitigate, if not eliminate these challenges? And so I highlight that. And then through the course of our work together, I am constantly referencing that cloud of terms that they surfaced in the beginning and talking about how these models can address those challenges. And so one of the things, like I was working with a group of English teachers and one of their words on the cloud was grading. It's just like the time they spend outside of class grading student work, giving feedback on student work is, it's exhausting. And I can totally relate to that. So I tell them, you know, Five years ago, I decided I'm all done. I'm not taking grading home anymore. I'm not taking feedback home anymore. Instead, I'm going to figure out how do I design lessons that create the time and space where if kids are working on an essay, if they're working on a project, I can get into documents or I can sit right with them and give them feedback as they work so that end product is stronger. So maybe I'm pulling them into a teacher-led station in a station rotation where I'm jumping in and out of documents, giving them feedback as they're working. Or I am pulling a student at a time to have a quick conversation about where they're at in a project or an offline task. And if I wanna have a, uh, if I wanna grade something, I think kids should be sitting right next to me, looking at what I'm looking at, hearing what I'm thinking when I grade their work. So I tell teachers, I'm like, I had to take a good hard look at what I was grading in order to make that sustainable. But I stopped taking grading home and I started pulling it into the classroom. It was transformative. And then I could spend my time outside a class focused on the aspects of my job that I find really invigorating and energizing, like designing lessons and designing projects, those kinds of pieces of this job I love. And I don't mind doing those things at home on a weekend at all. But what I don't want to do is slog through a mountain of student work, trying to give feedback often that isn't timely, that they can't really act on. And so when teachers, when the teachers in the room heard that I had stopped taking grading home because I was using these models and pulling those things into the classroom, they were like, okay, Tell us how, yeah, we want to do that. Tell us how you did that. Eureka you know? moment. Yeah, yeah. So I think for, for teachers, we have to be aware that there needs to be a pro- like a value proposition. You, yes, you're going to, you're going to invest time and energy doing, learning these things and you're going to make mistakes and it's not going to be super smooth in the beginning, but here's what's potentially the benefits for you in terms of how you spend your time and energy as a teacher, spend less of it managing, you know, managing a class, getting them to be quiet and listen and more time sitting next to kids, working directly with them. I mean, those, those are really exciting benefits of blended learning. What kind of comes through there, I guess, which is a, a sort of an interesting parallel. If, you know, when we were talking earlier about with students within a blended classroom, the importance of feedback and that channel of communication, would it be fair to say that in a similar way, you know, coaching teachers, training teachers themselves to implement blended learning, that feedback that you were talking about, making it about addressing teachers' pain points is just as important. Absolutely. And then once I've done whole group trainings, then I move into coaching. And typically I'm like a, I'm a coach for hire. I'll come in for four days and work with a group of teachers or I'll come in for 24 days. And so I do my coaching in two day kind of pairings where 
we will meet and we'll have a conversation about what are the goals the teachers have? What are they trying to accomplish? What's been really challenging in their work that they want to address in this coaching session? And then we do co-lesson planning where I actually get into the weeds with them and not just talk about what they should do to design the lesson later, but like, let's create it right now. Let's type up directions. Let's get the, the online pieces ready to go. And then on day two, I get into classrooms and I can either co-teach with them. So if they're nervous about, you know, oh, I'm going to have them doing this thing over here. Could you lead that part? Could you onboard kids? Could you run a station? Just be a co-teacher in the room. Or sometimes I will go in and I'll do real-time coaching. So we can start treating the lesson as an opportunity to learn so that at any point during the lesson, the teacher or myself can pause and then we can have a quick discussion. What's going well? What are we wondering? What could maybe be changed? Make a small adjustment and then continue with the lesson. So instead of the teacher kind of like blundering through the lesson and feeling like, oh, this piece didn't go well and that didn't go well and I wish I could have changed it, we actually do, we are able to be nimble and make those changes in the lesson. So they don't have to wait until the next class or next year to try to fine tune those parts of that lesson. So there's, there. I have a whole coaching cycle that I wrote about in one of my books called Power Up Blended Learning where I talk about the very specific um, things that I do when I'm working with teachers to try to get them kind of moving through a learning cycle where they're really thinking about what do I want to achieve? All right, let me build a lesson to try to, to meet these goals. Let's implement that lesson with support. Let's reflect on how that went and how we might change or modify that in the future. Yeah. And it's it, what, what's really coming across for me as well is that it's, it's, it's really a step-by-step process isn't it and it's not this idea of being thrown into the deep end with a whole new scary set of resources and teaching whatever it's building it being flexible with it and I I, I get as you're talking about with yourself there in the room initially but all of that to build towards a point slowly but surely where it's this teacher taking the reins themselves Absolutely. And when I come into a school campus, since I don't I don't work with just one school every single day as a coach, the, the coaches on site, they shadow. So they sit in the room with us and they watch and they, they can interact or they can just observe. And so that when I leave, they're there to continue that learning because – I, unfortunately, so often professional learning is treated like an event, right? We're going to have two days of PD in the beginning of the school year, and that's all you're going to need for the entire year. Learning mm. is a process, just like it is for our kids. We have to figure out how to build learning into the fabric of our teacher's school day so that they're constantly kind of iterating and improving on their practice. And I think coaching is a really effective way to get that done. But the goal is definitely to support teachers so that then they can just keep iterating and improving their practice and refining it on their own. Absolutely. It's a really, it's a really, really good point. And it's, it's something that, you know, some guests we've had on before have, have stressed as well, this idea of learning development can't not can't be a, a two-day thing it can't be like a couple of hours in a room mm. and like right we can do that now happy days and then off they go and it's just not the reality it, it having to be an ongoing an ongoing practice which builds step by step um so it, it, it definitely sounds like you're doing the right thing with regards to that and implementing that change um on that idea of change in a it, in a broader sense, I wanted to kind of close us out by talking about, I guess, the future of blended learning. You've talked about it a bit before. You mentioned earlier that, you know, you foresee blended learning just becoming learning, which mm -hmm. is a certainly it, it, it's a bold claim, but it's definitely something that <laughs> could well become. Uh, I'm just covering myself there so that I can right. be, uh, I can sit on both sides. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about and, and get your opinion on how you think, I guess, current and ongoing factors are going to affect blended learning in the future. Obviously, you know, the, the immediate one that springs to mind is the situation we find ourselves in now with mm -hmm. relation to COVID-19 and, and schools all around the world are kind of being forced into adopting at least some elements of, of blended learning and having to take some of their learning online, but also you know, changing attitudes towards, as you said earlier, homework or even student assessment, uh, more and more resources coming, online resources coming into the world. How do you think, I know this is a very 
broad question, but how do you think these factors, you can pick and choose whichever ones you like, how do you think these are going to affect blended learning going forward? Well, I think I'll have to spend a lot less time justifying the value of blended learning, right? The the why behind blended learning is being answered right now because yeah. learning is constantly being interrupted. Yet there's no excuse for that at this point, at this day and age, for learning to be ground to a halt every time we have some kind of emergency. So I live in California, in Northern California. We have had I, my house burned down in 2017. Like I was part of the casualties of the tub, Tubbs fire. You know, I know right. what it's like to have your school stop for weeks at a time because of a fire. Or even this last year, we had another round of fires. And so they were turning off the the electricity. And so there were these rolling blackouts to try to stop any further fires. And so kids were out of school for days, weeks, and then, you know, other parts of the country, it's snowstorms or it's a pandemic. But there really shouldn't be anything that can stop learning the way that COVID-19 has just stopped learning from happening. Kids should be able to continue learning online. And so for those folks who are dabbling in blended learning before, they were experimenting with engaging kids online, I have to imagine that this situation is a lot less stressful, that they're able to kind of build a little bit on that momentum that they have, as opposed to those teachers who are like, hmm, I don't, I'm not really comfortable with technology. I don't know that I see the value of technology. And now, oh my gosh, if I want to reach my kids, I have to figure out how to do that entirely online. So I think schools are going to start to realize that if they want to be able to maximize their, you know, impact on students and learning, they're going to have to adopt some of these strategies in regular times so that when we hit these unexpected moments, teachers have the skills, the access to resources online, they have some experience engaging kids online so that hopefully learning doesn't stop because we hit one of these emergencies. Because it just feels like there's, at least from my perspective, there's just more more and more of them popping up. And I really mm. worry about what's going to happen for kids who have spent five, six months, maybe by the time we end summer, who've been home and not really engaged in academic endeavors. Like how far behind are they going to fall in terms of skill sets? What's the impact going to be on them moving forward and trying to build on skills that are kind of shaky? Yeah, well, blended learning will come to the rescue by the sounds of things. And it's I guess uh, what's coming across is that it, you know, it will, it will become something that's uh, at least seen as a lot more, more valuable, um, which will then obviously build onto it being adopted more and more, um, hopefully globally, but by the sounds of things, at least within within the states, within your own immediate environment. Yeah, and I hope it means school districts are putting energy and resources into that training piece so that teachers feel like they have been equipped with the skills they need to be successful in this space. Because I think a lot of the frustration and the anger and the disillusionment right now is because teachers have been thrust into this online environment without that training and that experience. And they don't feel like they can be successful, which is really hard because they miss their kids, they miss their classrooms, and they weren't expecting expecting to have to transition their courses online. Yeah. Well, I guess if there's any you know, positive, if we can look for any silver lining out of what is a very difficult situation um, for for everyone, is that it, it could facilitate a, this move, a move where there's more open acceptance and movement towards online resources and what they can offer. So that is all that we have time for, unfortunately, with regards to blended learning. But before you go, we always like to ask our guests to close us out with either a little bit of advice for teachers maybe it's a fun anecdote from your own teaching days doesn't even necessarily have to have anything to do with education in general just either a little story a little piece of advice uh, that teachers out there will enjoy so what have you got for us i think just to if you have teachers who are on the call, one of the things I would recommend is don't try to do it all at once. Even when I lead trainings and we go over all of this information and all these different tools, I remind people, start with one strategy, one tool, and just know 
you are going to make a boatload of mistakes. So when I first started teaching, I walked away from my classroom on more days than not thinking, wow, that was a hot mess. That didn't go anywhere how I imagined it would go. And I didn't think, oh, I'm going to quit. I thought, all right, how am I going to do it differently? How am I going to improve it next time? And I think even for those of us who have been in the classroom for a really long time, we have to treat ourselves gently like we're first year teachers when we're trying a new model, instructional model, like a blended learning model, and just celebrate mistakes. I like to invite students into the mistakes, right? Wow, this didn't go well. How could we change it next time? What do you guys think? And really engage your group to try to improve practices in your classroom because it's not going to go smoothly. And that's okay because failure is part of the learning process. We need to just embrace it. Yeah, it's really sound advice and definitely very reassuring advice, I imagine, for a lot of teachers, maybe particularly younger teachers out there who might be hearing it. (laughs) That is unfortunately all that we have time for today. Catelyn, thank you so much for coming on, for chatting to us. Yeah, thanks for having and me. And giving us your, no worries, thanks for coming. Um, for everybody listening, if you want to hear any more episodes, you can find them at whatever platform you are listening to this on. And if you want to check us out on our main site, you can find us at getatomy.com. For now, it is goodbye from Catelyn. Bye. And goodbye from me. See ya. See ya.